our August presentation, we talked about the county office or the county county site between the courthouses and, and the house to me, the old county seat, that kind of stuff. So we, we kind of talked about that in this last period. So now we're getting back into our chronological study and we're going to be looking at the post-Civil War era, looking at Reconstruction and the first KKK. So, bit of a refresher for those who saw this a couple weeks ago. This was Swanee County as of 1865. This is from a Union source during the Civil War. So it's not as accurate as it could be, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago. They don't even have live oak listed on here uh, between Kyler and Houston. Uh, a few other things are missing, but by and large, that's Swanee County as of 1865 at the end of the Civil War. Still a young county, small county population-wise. And then the war ends. And as I mentioned a couple months ago now, maybe three months ago, uh, the Civil War did not have great direct impact on Suwannee County. You know, we had a few things here and there that happened. We had uh, ships coming up the Suwannee River and whatnot, steamboats. Uh, but other than the loss of slaves, which was a substantial amount, we didn't have any direct destruction or direct damage to Suwannee County, unlike a lot of places, say in Virginia and other places like that. So we got off pretty lucky, to be honest. But there was still this era of change not just for Swanee County, not just for Florida, but for the entire country, especially the South. So, as the war ended, as it was getting close to conclusion, and the writing was on the wall, President Abraham Lincoln had decided on a way to reconstruct the South after the inevitable end of the war. And he proposed a very moderate form of reconstruction. Basically, things like, uh, if you wanted to be pardoned, if you had served against the North, or if you just wanted to be pardoned, you basically had to uh, not have held Confederate civil office, you had not mistreated Union prisoners, and you would sign an oath of allegiance. Basically, that was all you needed to do under Lincoln's proposal for Reconstruction to be able to be reunited with the rest of the Union. Also, states. He suggested and recommended that a state could re-enter the Union after 10% of its population voted to do so, basically. Really, there was not much else related to it. Um, <laughs> we talked about a couple months ago with the Lincoln assassination of conspiracy and how one of our local boys was involved in that. And ironically, Lincoln's assassination made things worse on the South. I mean, Reconstruction became what it was because of Lincoln's assassination and the Southerners who had participated in that. So Lewis Thornton Powell, our 21-year-old uh, Civil War soldier from Swanee County that was involved in this, really ended up harming the South. The places that they were trying to protect and preserve uh, harmed them by assassinating Lincoln. Uh, because of this moderate Reconstruction, once Lincoln was assassinated, the radical Republicans in his cabinet and in Congress, um, and we, I, let me, Throw it aside here. When I talk about Republicans and Democrats in this era, you can almost flip them today, more or less. So when I talk about Republicans, I'm talking about how Democrats are today. And when I talk about Democrats, I'm talking about how Republicans are today. Not one to one ratio, but there's a lot of similarities. And we'll get into some of those as we go on. But the radical Republicans, the the what we call far, probably far left today but those folks pushed for what was called radical reconstruction. It's like, oh no, the South has to pay for what they've done. We just fought bloody four years of war. You're letting them off too easy. Now Lincoln's gone. We don't have to worry about him. Actually, Vice President Andrew Johnson, who had been from Tennessee, but still served in the Union and was Vice President during this era, he also pushed for a moderate reconstruction. Part of it being from Tennessee, he didn't want to see his home state you know, brought down and cowered to their knees. So he pushed for moderate reconstruction. Well, these radical Republicans didn't like that. And so that was one of the reasons really behind his uh, near impeachment. He was the first president that came before impeachment proceedings. And that was one of the reasons why. There were lots of other things. But behind it all was pretty much he was trying to be nice to the South, his, home his hometown. So that happened. Um, he was not actually, the impeachment did not go through, he was not removed from office, 
but those radical Republicans were able to push the radical Reconstruction upon the South. So that entered that era of Reconstruction. Meanwhile, as that's going on, we've got the individual states, the southern states, are trying to, to get back to as much as normalcy as they can. And so we have the passing of, in Florida anyway, of an 1865 state constitution. There on the left is part of it. Uh, our our uh, representative for this constitutional convention of 1865 was Silas Overstreet. He was a doctor. He was from the Columbus area, which is now Swanee State Park. And he was our, he served in the Civil War. He was in one of the local units, but as a surgeon and whatnot. So he served as the local representative for this constitutional convention. And basically the 1865 convention, uh, constitution was very similar to the previous ones, other than eliminating the slavery part. There really wasn't much change otherwise. So they thought that would get by, so that's what the state approved. But it was never fully put into place because that's as that's going on, Reconstruction begins and they throw it out. So basically what happens is uh, for several years here in Florida and even more years in places like Louisiana and some other southern states, you've got basically military occupation. Easiest way to put it. For us, it happened for about three years really badly. And in 1868, we were allowed to have another state constitutional convention uh, be approved. Uh, our representatives were Andrew Schuler and Thomas Erglehart. They were our representatives. And basically, this is when control of the state returned to the civilians. Before that point, it was under military rule. Uh, the governor, quote unquote, was a military appointed one. Uh, governor Meade, I believe. There had been a General Meade, fought in several major Civil War battles, fought against Lee and whatnot. Uh, he basically was the governor, so to speak, of Florida for a few years. Uh, so under military rule, but in 1868, that constitution was approved, and we reverted to civilian rule. Now, there were lots of caveats, lots of changes to it. Um, it allowed African Americans the right to vote here in Florida, so that was a good thing. It required an oath of loyalty of all citizens because there was still this issue of, of people who wanted to go back to the way things were. Um, some other issues with that, one of the good things about it was when they approved this 1868 Constitution, they basically required the county commissioners to take minutes of their meetings. Up until that point, we had four county commissioners at the time. Our four county commissioners met and made decisions and nobody wrote down what they did. And so the, the clerk's office where I work, we have minutes all the way back to not the beginning of the county, but 1868, October of 1868. And I'll show you the, a copy of it in just a second. But the, so for the first 10 years of Swanee County's history, when a lot of these major decisions were being made, we don't have it. Because why bother writing them down? Now we have other documentation that can provide some of the information. And that's why we know about things like Houston and uh, different locations with that, but not from the county commission records because they just don't exist. It's very aggravating. This is a scan version, an old scan version, microfilm copy of the original documents that we saw in the office. And it's basically meant to the regular meeting of Swanee County uh, from the 5th day of October 1868. It lists the county commissioners, either whether they're there or not. Uh, and then basically, as they did every year pretty much. They had a slate of, of jurors, potential jurors for the year. So that's where all these other things come in. So that's the first page of our county commission minutes that we have, and we still continue to take today. That's one of my jobs at the office is clerk to the board of county commissioners. I, I sit up there usually, uh, me and my assistant, one of us, will sit up there and take minutes of the meeting. So we have a permanent record of what happens because these are permanent records. Don't get rid of them. So it is good to have them. And there's so much I've learned from these old minutes. Granted, a whole day's worth of meeting might be one paragraph long. They didn't go into a lot of detail back then, but it still gives us more than we have in the first 10 years of our history where there's nothing. So, Reconstruction. Very trying period for, again, Swanee County, Florida, and the entire South. Military occupation, military governors, lots of Venting of frustrations that sometimes were happening. We had people called carpetbaggers and scalawags. Carpetbaggers, which this is a drawing from I think 1872, uh, the southern representation of a uh, carpetbagger, 
were people from up north that moved down south. Supposedly, often they would throw their stuff into a carpet, wrap it up, and, and bring it down. So that's why they're called carpetbaggers. Um, so they were from the north that came down the south to oftentimes exploit the south. Scalawags were people from the south that helped the carpetbaggers. Um, you know, they're called different, at different times in different countries, they're called different things. Um, but basically they worked with carpetbaggers. Sometimes these scalawags were people that, that lived in the South, but were always against the Civil War. They, they, they were always against the breakup of the, the Union. So they were pro-Union. Sometimes they really didn't care. It's like, I just want to stay out of it. Sometimes they were just people who saw an opportunity. And we'll talk about one of them here in a little bit. But they saw an opportunity for, for money or power or vengeance. You can just name it, whatever, all kinds of different issues. So we've got these two groups of people that are harming the South by and large. Now, not every carpetbagger was a bad person. I'm not saying every person from the North was bad. So I know there are folks from here from the North. That's not <laughs> what I mean. But before you misinterpret what I'm saying, but there were enough of them that were causing trouble down here that they had it on label, let's put it that way. So as a counter to these groups of people, we have the rise of other groups in the South, the most famous of which is the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, or the KKKK, the Knights of Ku Klux Klan. So they came into being supposedly December of 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. Um, they were one of several groups. They were the most known, most well-known group of Southern, how do we put this? They were in favor of what? Resistors. There we go, Southern resistors, that sounds good, I like that. Resistors, who wanted to push back from these Northerners coming in and changing the landscape of the country, of the South anyway. Uh, a lot of times they were politicians that had been removed from office. They were some of those plantation owners who had lost their livelihood. Sometimes they were poor farmers who didn't want black folks to get their jobs. Uh, sometimes they were people who just had a vendetta against somebody and let's dress in a sheet and let's take care of them this way. So the KKK became the most well-known of these groups. Uh, there were the Knights of the White Camellia, the Southern Cross, there were a bunch of other ones over the years. So they are formed, supposedly 1865, they grow, they spread throughout the South, and they cause a lot of havoc. Um, you know, veterans, that kind of stuff. There are, in 1866, Mississippi's governor talks about a lack of control, and there are armed bands of these soldiers, ex-Confederate soldiers, most of them, that are just roaming at will. Basically, they are vigilantes, they are doing whatever they want to do, and there's little that the government, the state governments anyway, can do, and the federal government for a time can do. They're leaving bodies on the, ro on the roads, they're burning houses, just all kinds of, uh, of different stuff. Here is how a historian, not me, but somebody else named Elaine France Parsons, discusses them. She says, lifting the Klan mask revealed a chaotic multitude of anti-black vigilante groups, disgruntled poor white farmers, wartime guerrilla bands, displaced democratic politicians, illegal whiskey distillers, coercive moral reformers, sadists, rapists, white workmen fearful of black competition, employers trying to enforce labor discipline, common thieves, neighbors with decades old grudges, and even a few freedmen and white Republicans who allied with Democratic whites or had criminal agendas of their own. Indeed, all they had in common, besides being overwhelmingly white Southern Democrat, was that they called themselves or were called Klansmen. So, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people that were involved in this. A reign of terror. I mean, it, it really was, was pretty bad. We had something similar with other people in the last few years, a couple years ago, I guess. Uh, some of those riots and stuff, it was similar to that, I guess. It would probably be the, the closest modern representation I can think of in the United States uh, of that kind of happening. So all that's kind of uh, death, destruction, burn them out, kill them, maim them, whatever is going on. So we see a lot of that in the South starting in 1865 through the Reconstruction era. Uh, now then. It became so prevalent that the federal government got involved and they basically took testimony and it was called the Joint Select Committee to Inquire into the Condition of Affairs in the Late Insurrectionary States. They like those long titles back then. There's some other books I've talked about in the past. 
that have you know paragraph long titles. <laughs> so basically, the federal government took an interest, and they had a committee. And you can see there's several books of them. This one is the Miscellaneous in Florida. Most of the other states got their own, but we were miscellaneous in Florida. <laughs> As I mentioned during the Civil War, we were the least populated of the southern states. Yeah. So we got thrown in with miscellaneous in Florida. But it's published in 1872. A lot of it happened in 1871 as they are reviewing what's going on. He reports about the murders he knew about or he had heard about. Um, there's some dispute of these numbers, but here's the list. Madison County, 20. Columbia County, 16. Taylor County, 7. Alachua County, 16. Swanee County, 10, Hamilton County, 9, Lafayette County, 4. That's in our area. That's good compared to Jackson County. You do not want to live in Jackson County, Mariana, that area. They had 153. So that was a bad place to live in this era. Uh, he also reported that Madison County Sheriff uh, stated there were actually 37 murders, not 20. So even these numbers are disputed because they might be higher than this. Uh, the Sheriff of Columbia County was run out of town. Several Republican politicians were either killed or scared off. Lots of troubles going on. And even in our records, those minutes I was talking about, you start reading through them. And when they talk about paying the sheriff or paying commissioners, it's funny we have a lot of turnover in these years. Some, <laughs> some county commissioners only are, are in office for a few months, and then they're replaced by somebody else. It's not an election year. And that person stays for a few months, and then they're gone. Uh, the sheriffs, same way, or the sheriff's deputies, left and right, They're, they are leaving, they are fleeing town. It's not a good time to be in politics in the South, especially politics, but just in general. Lots of things happen. One of the <clears throat> murders that occurs in this area, it's actually in Lafayette County where it happens, is the murder of Judge uh, John Newton Criminger. He was the Republican County Judge of Lafayette County. He was a Union sympathizer during the Civil War. So he was in the South, but he favored the North. Um, <laughs> he is killed on his front porch in New Troy, which at the time was the county seat of, of Lafayette County. It no longer exists. Mayo wasn't invented yet or established yet. He is killed on his front porch. He is shot from the second floor of the courthouse by the ex-clerk of the court, John Ponshear, who Judge Creminger had had removed from office and appointed his son-in-law in his place. So Judge Creminger had put his own son-in-law to replace this clerk. This clerk had been a you know, Southern supporter and whatnot. So uh, J.C. Ponshear, John Ponshear, he, he kills this judge based on what had happened to him. Um, Ponshear was not located for a while. It took him a while to be found because he had lots of friends here in Suwannee County. And Lafayette County being just across the river and New Troy being just across the river, he would come over here when somebody wanted, wanted to hunt him because he had lots of friends here. He had, had business here and owned land and whatnot. So he had a lot of friends in Suwannee County. So it took a couple years for them to find him. And I believe he was found and actually killed in the process. I found the newspaper and I forgot to bring it with me. There's stuff I didn't bring because of the weather. I'm sorry I didn't have any documents. Uh, but one of them was a discussion of him being found out in the, the boondocks, out in the woods, and killed by a posse that was hunting him down. But it was like two years later. So that happened in Lafayette, but we were related because it was Swanee County. Now, in that discussion of Judge Criminger's death, uh, there were some others involved in testimony of what was happening locally. One of them was a guy by the name of T.T. Thomas T. Long. Uh, Thomas Long was the circuit judge for this area, for our district, the Swanee District at the time, which included Swanee County. And so if you were to read this testimony, which you can find this online, by the way, it's where I found it. Uh, you can read through it, and you will find his testimony. He's talking about uh, problems with Southern whites. He's talking about uh, the Republican whites and blacks in the area being attacked in and around Swanee County. Now, Thomas T. Long was from here. Other people that are interviewed locally say similar things. Hey, these bad things are happening to Republicans, whether they're white or black. Uh, bad things are happening to them. But when you start reading through even this information that's here, you find that Judge Long was probably not the most upstanding of citizens 
or politicians. Um, there are suggestions about being corrupt, being an opportunist. He was a Southerner. He had lived in the South. He actually had been in favor of secession originally, but once the tide of war changed, he decided he was against it. So he was able to finagle himself back into the graces of the Republicans and of the federal government by joining the Republican Party and being pardoned because I was really against the Civil War, although he was in favor of it beforehand. So he was able to do that. Um, and he basically rode the fence. When it benefited him, he would help the Southerners, i.e. the Democrats and whoever else, but if it benefited him from the North, he would do that. So he basically rode the fence, got money, got bribes, got whatever from everybody. And according to some of this testimony in here, actually, his, uh, when he became circuit judge, it cost him $3,000 then, which was $50,000 a day. So the inference is that he bribed people to vote for him. That's how he became circuit court judge. So probably not the most upstanding individual. Another gentleman that's interviewed is William Bryson. He was from Tennessee. He was a judge up in Tennessee. He moved to Suwannee County and became our state attorney. And by the time this is going on, he's also a circuit judge for this area. He later becomes a state senator. And then if I recall correctly, he becomes clerk to the House of Representatives. So he is in politics for many years. Not saying he's a bad person, just saying that he was. So he talks about the bad things happening here in Suwannee County and around. He's talking about Columbia, Lafayette, Suwannee, Hamilton, Madison, Taylor counties. And it's hard to find the perpetrators that are doing it because they flee and they've got lots of friends in low places. Um, they, they, they hide, they, they go around, lots of sympathy in the community for these people, even though they're committing acts of violence. But because it's Republicans and, and black people, eh, who cares? Um, he also points out that he continues to hold court even though he has been threatened with assassination. So he is not assassinated, he continues on. But there's lots of issues. So this, this federal committee compiles all this information, presents it to Congress. They are not happy about what's going on. So then they start passing some bills. The first one that really is in, uh, enacted about it is the Force Act of 1870. And that is enacted to help enforce the 14th and 15th Amendments that basically allow African Americans the right to vote, those kinds of things, and, and equal rights, quote unquote, those kinds of things. So that helps, but that's not enough, <clears throat> but it does start the decline of some of these organizations like KKK. And uh, I mentioned at the beginning, this is the first KKK because it basically goes away and another one comes up about 30 years later, 40 years later. So uh, the KKK starts to decline a little bit and some of these other groups, White Magnolia, Southern Cross and whatnot, they start to decline because of this. Even more so is the Civil Rights Act of 1871. Uh, this one is popularly called the Ku Klux Klan Act. And that's really what it focuses on are these groups who are committing acts of terror, I guess we could say. And it gives the federal government more powers. Because the first one was a start, but there was not a lot of backbone to it, not a lot of enforcement ability. Yeah, we admit that this is happening, we see there's a problem, but there wasn't much the federal government could do about it other than point it out. It's like, hey, what's going wrong? But this, this 1871 Act, the Ku Klux Klan Act, gives the federal government all kinds of powers to enforce what's going on, um, stopping the intimidation. The gentleman who proposes it, <coughs> who wrote this act, is this gentleman here, who if you are a Civil War buff, probably recognize him as General Benjamin Butler. The Beast of New Orleans is what he was nicknamed by the South. Uh, this is the gentleman who's most known for passing a general order. I don't remember the number, if it was 15 or something, but after he became the, the military general over New Orleans when it was captured, he is the one that got tired of ladies dumping their chamber pots onto his troops. And so he basically passed an order saying, any lady caught doing that will be assumed to be, uh, basically the gist of it is being a prostitute. And so he was called the Beast of New Orleans because of that. It's a whole funny thing and uh, you know, interesting. But he became a senator, and he's the one that wrote and pushed this act to be approved. So this happened, and because of the 1870 Act and the 1871 Act from the federal government, these uh, southern groups are, are decimated. 
KKK and whatnot are destroyed. The Attorney General uh, leads prosecutions, and he, he is, he's going for them. And so a lot of them are hit. Uh, the White League, the Red Shirts, all these other ones are being hit. The White League that is in Louisiana, the Red Shirts, Mississippi, North, South Carolina, all those kinds of things. Um, they are hit hard. Are they totally eliminated? No, they are still able to intimidate. Even in the 1874 and 1876 elections, they're able to intimidate black voters and, and white voters alike. But their power is greatly diminished and the back of them is basically broken because of these two acts. So, meanwhile, while all that's going on at a state federal level, we have business continuing as much as usual as possible. And one of the things that, can, uh, that carries on in Swanee County are ferries. We don't have bridges over the Swanee River, but we do have multiple ferries. And so we have to have the, uh, I guess from the state constitution, instead of it being a federal or a, a state act of I'm approving this, this ferry like it used to be, it goes into the hands of the county commissioners of the two counties where the ferries cross. So in our case, Swanee County, we've got Lafayette County, Madison County, Hamilton County at that time that we connect with ferries. So those commissioners work together to set rates and whatnot. It seems to be wherever the ferry owner lived, I think is more so the one the county in charge of it. So we've got in our office, service office, 1870s, 1880s, I've got probably a dozen or more ferry uh, petitions, ferry approvals, lots of different things. Uh, let's see, Barrington's Ferry, Levingston's Ferry, which was near Dowling Park, Charles Ferry, which is Charles Springs today, Platt's Ferry, which is at Columbus, Rollins Bluff Ferry at what would become Branford, uh, Mineral Springs, which is Swanee Springs, and, and many more. But in these petitions, and again, they're at the clerk's office, I can pull them out and show you, it would show what they could charge. So typically, for instance, 1872, which is when I believe this one's from, well, this is 1873, it is from A.C. Stevens, yeah, whose son Worth Stevens owned a big store we'll talk about later on in a few months. Anyway, th these guys, the typical ferry ride costs were 10 cents per foot, so per foot, uh, foot passenger, not per foot, but per, <laughs> per foot passenger, 25 cents for a man on a horse, 50 cents for a horse and buggy or an ox cart, 75 cents for a two horse wagon, $1 for a four horse wagon, and $1.50 for a six horse. So, lost your petition. This one actually is, uh, yeah, the one at Columbus. Ultimately, if you read the whole thing, it's from Charles Dean to some folks, and, and others have to to swear that they know this guy and they agree he's a good guy, and blah, 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 blah. So this one's for Dean's Ferry there at Columbus. If you go to the state park today, you can see where the ferry crossed, on our side anyway, because there's a, there's a ramp, basically it's a slope down to the water. That's where it was. That was not the first one there, but that was one of them. Some of these ferries go on for decades. There was, I think the last one on the Swanee River, which was in Gilchrist County, I think was running up to the 50s, 1950s. There's a picture I've got of a, like a 57 Chevy or something being floated over the, the ferry crossing. So, interesting. We got rid of ours before then. So, ferries are going on, other things are going on. And I talked about this in our last presentation about the county site and the county seat because this building had been built by Nathan Walker and Henry Wise as a county commissioner, as a courthouse for the county commissioners when they were still trying to figure out where the county seat was going to be. Is it going to be Houston? Is it going to be where it is now? Is it going to be where the old part of the original part of Live Oak was, which was a few blocks to the west, where Houston Street and uh, Highway 90 are? That was pretty much downtown Live Oak originally. So this building was built a couple of blocks away from that original downtown Live Oak and was proposed and almost really became twice the county seat where the courthouse was. But what happened in the 1870s during this reconstruction era, 1873, it was sold to the Florida Bethlehem Baptist Theological Institute, which was a group of African Americans who wanted to 
uh, produce an area or a group of higher learning, college, a, a school, whatever you call it, for higher learning of African Americans. And so they instituted it. Lots of teachers, African American teachers went there, and they gradually added on more programs, became a college, eventually a university. Then they merged with a St. Augustine-based unit group, and were over there for a few years. Now they are located in Miami. They are Florida Memorial University, but in the time period we're talking about, they were usually called the Florida Institute. <clears throat> and as I talked about last month, or last time we met, it was used by the African American community for decades as a school. They had additions, uh, other buildings put to it, but eventually after they had moved, it was time to build a new public hospital in Suwannee County, and that was the site that was determined to be, so they tore those down after selling them at public auction. Meanwhile, other things are going on. <clears throat> there is a gentleman by the name of Nathan Holmes Bishop. He and his assistant basically sailed from Quebec, Canada, sailed down through the United States, uh, taking lots of different routes. They basically use a paper canoe, which I've got a whole description in here about it. Um, molded, let's see, they used yeah. manila paper, which had manila hemp at the time. Several layers are applied, each sheet running the full length and breadth of the molding hull. The first sheet was applied slightly damp, then tacked down and covered with adhesive. So basically, they built it up out of this manila hemp, this paper basically at the time. And there's a whole lot of discussion in it, you can look it up. When dried, the hole measured no more than one eighth to one tenth of an inch thick. So they have more faith in it than I did. <laughs> anyway, the Voyager Paper Coon and this guy, this Mr. Bishop, wrote a book of his travels. Again, he traversed the entire United States, north to south, and he basically ends his trip at the mouth of the Suwannee River. So he comes through Suwannee County. And so he talks about it. Um, Let's see, the name of it was the Maria Teresa, by the way. It says it down there. He talks about, here he talks about Suwannee Springs, Old Columbus, Ellaville, Charles Ferry. He mentions John Perbians, who was county commissioner. We talked about him a couple weeks ago, because he was suing when the county site almost got moved. And then he became county commissioner and he was suing himself. I remember that discussion. <laughs> if you were there, okay. He met him, uh, those kinds of things. So it's very interesting if you, if you look it up. That again is online if you want to look up, but he talks about, he spent some time in Ricksford, which was a community at the time north of Live Oak, a couple miles north of Live Oak. It's Ricksford Road, if you know where Ricksford Road is. I don't know what the number is. It's always Ricksford Road. Uh, but the community there, and he just talks about sailing down the river, and, and just the things he saw, logs, as they were doing the logging, uh, talks about gators, and just all kinds of different stuff. It's a very interesting, story to read that portion, which again is about the last chapter in the book of Swanee County. So it's online, downloaded. I didn't read the rest of it because I didn't care about having it up north. No offense to the northerners. <laughs> I was focused on Swanee <laughs> County. So it's interesting to read. Gentlemen from the well, I guess from the north you could say. George Franklin Drew was born in Alton, New Hampshire, August 6, 1827. In the 1840s, he moves to Columbus, Georgia, and gets into business, becomes a successful businessman. He's a machinist, uh, timber industry, those kinds of things. So he becomes a big businessman. When the Civil War starts, he remains in the South, but he really doesn't want there to be a war. He is a unionist. He, he's really in favor of preserving the Union. But he stays in the South. He doesn't move. He doesn't fight against the, the South either. He probably provides goods and services to both sides. We're not particularly sure about that. We do know he was arrested at one point by the Confederate authorities because they claim he's helping the North, but he's helping everybody. I guess he doesn't really care who it is. If you want to buy something from him, I'll sell it. I don't care who you are. So he does that. Well, at the end of the war, his plans are to get out of the United States and move to Brazil. So he starts making his way down south do what? Oh, sorry. So he starts making his way down south. Well, he stops when he gets to the Swanee River area. He decides, hey, there's lots of timber here. There's lots of business opportunities. So he moves to, ends up being Madison County, just across the river from the community of Columbus. 
He establishes a large sawmill. Supposedly, it's the largest in Florida at the time. I don't know if that's true or not, but I have read that in different sources. But he builds up a community across from Columbus that he calls Ellaville, named after one of his uh, domestic servants, black, sl not slaves, but servants, named Ella. And so that becomes Ellaville, which then draws the population of Columbus across the river. So Columbus and Swanee County dies out. Ellaville becomes a big bustling community, 500 plus people at one point, and uh, he makes a lot of money. In 1876, he is nominated to be the Democratic nominee for governor in Florida. He wins, because he's, he's not a career politician. He's kind of been on the fence. He's helped everybody. He hasn't you know, been bitter towards either side. And so he is elected as governor of Florida in 1876. So he goes in in 1877. The margin was 24,179 to 23,982. So almost 50,000 votes, less than 200 separated. I'm adding right. Yeah, 200 separated basically. So close, close voted. He beats out the Republican. And Marcellus Stearns. Very controversial election, all kinds of things going. Uh, one of the stories that I have read is after he is elected, he is going to be going to Tallahassee to be sworn in, and Republican folks don't like it, and so the military, under Republican leadership, is sending troops from Jacksonville to arrest him by railroad. Well, they have to cross the Swanee River. At the time, as I mentioned a couple months ago, there was a wooden covered railroad bridge over the Swanee River at Columbus, where the state park is today. And so he basically sends people that are loyal to him out onto that bridge, takes measurements of it, because, let me back up, he's friends with a lot of people in Florida. He's got a lot of people he knows, and in his industry he's made lots of friends, including those that run telegraphs, and the railroads and stuff. So as soon as that military force starts uh, traveling by train from Jacksonville, he gets to telegraph, hey, you got people coming to arrest you. So he's caught wind of it. So he sends out people loyal to him to measure that railroad bridge at the state park, where the state park is today, measures all of it, takes the ties, like the railroad ties out of it, puts it, I think, in his barn, and then he burns the bridge down. So as the story goes, as the the train gets close to there, they realize there's no bridge, they stop, they're not able to cross over in time to stop him from going over to be sworn in. Now, apparently there's an assassination attempt there at the swearing in ceremony. But he survives, is uninjured, and becomes governor. Uh, one of his first official acts is basically to order that bridge be rebuilt. He knows it's important. <laughs> now, I've only read that in one account. I don't know how accurate it is, but I have read it, and there's a lot of details to it, so. Um, it's very possible it happened. I, I won't say it didn't happen. It's interesting. And it would go with what's going on in this time period. It's just not good. Not good at all. But during his administration, Reconstruction ended in Florida at that point, and a lot of basically the rest of the South. He pushes for smaller government. He pushes for uh, reducing expenses because what has been happening is under the previous administrations, under Reconstruction rule, Florida has been bled dry of its money, its misappropriated funds. Lots of bad things have happened under those carpetbaggers and scalawags. But he tries to build up the economic prosperity of the state. He pushes for a reduction in expenses. But he only serves one term. He's, he's not popular enough that they want to put him back in again, so they nominate somebody else, the Democrats do. And anyway, he retires from, from that. He goes to a business interest. He eventually sells in Jacksonville with his wife, Amelia. But this is his house. That was just across the river into Madison County. Beautiful house, beautiful gardens. Doesn't really do it justice, although you can see a lot of it. it that may be him standing there. It may not be. It's hard to tell. But it was built in 1868 by his brothers, because they moved down here also. And... Uh, as governor, there was not a governor's mansion at the time. So basically what he would do is pretty much every morning, whenever he was needed, he would hop on the train that was right in front of his house. This picture is actually probably taken from the train. Right in front of his house, he'd hop on, go to Tallahassee, conduct business, and then travel back. Because again, there was no mansion there, the governor's mansion in Tallahassee. 
So basically, as his governor, most of his business was conducted here. He had a little home office and whatnot. So he would conduct a lot of business there. I've read in one account that this was supposedly the first house in Florida with electricity, telephone, and a bathroom, Enter, you know, inside bathroom. I don't know if that's true or not, but I did read that, so I'm throwing it out there for you. Could be one of those legends. So he moves to Jacksonville, uh, drew lumber industry, all that kind of stuff. A lot of, a lot of them are over here. He's got a lot of the industry here because of our timber. So although he might be in Jacksonville, he is doing work in Suwannee County. He's doing work in Lafayette County, uh, things like that. Lots of various interests. But that's the governor's fortune in Tallahassee of him. He died on September 26, 1900, just days after his wife had died. Actually, a few hours, I'm sorry. A few hours after his wife died. He wrote this two days before he died. That's where the days come. He wrote this two days before he died to one of his children. He basically says, knowing that his wife was sick at that point, he said, I just, I don't want to live whenever she's gone. I did, let's quote, when she is taken, I don't care to live any longer. So basically, September 26th, she died. He took care of her funeral arrangements, went out on the front porch, sat in his rocking chair, and just died. Wow. The newspapers say he died of a broken heart. I can believe that. My great-grandparents died within two days of each other. I mean, it was a, a double funeral for them. You know, y'all probably know people that have done that too. So uh, he died. As one of his friends said, uh, he was seen to draw a long breath, gasp once or twice, after which his head fell to the back of the chair and immediately became motionless. So he died of a broken heart in 1900. He and his wife were buried in Jacksonville. Meanwhile, to answer your question about the house, the house was sold to various people over the years. It gradually fell into disrepair. I've got lots of pictures of it over the years, but... That's a whole other presentation. Over the years, it fell into disrepair. There were attempts, even in the 1950s, by the state to put money into it, to rebuild it, to, to restore it. But uh, I think I've got a copy of the letter at the office still. And they basically realized that the money they had allotted for it would not even repair the front porch. <laughs> I mean, it was thousands of dollars back then in the 50s, and it still, it was just, it was gone. It, it, was, it was going down. Uh, it was just way beyond what local folks and the state folks wanted to do. And as I've talked about before, the 1950s, 60s, 70s was an era of eh, out with the old and the new. Who cares about the old buildings and the old stuff? We need these modern, postmodern structures coming in. So it really was not a focus. If it had been today, they probably wouldn't have appropriated money for it. It was a governor's mansion, by the way. I mean, it was, it was a governor's house that served as the governor's mansion, basically. It would have been something preserved today. Not 60, 70 years ago. 50 years ago. So what happened was... It was abandoned. It was stripped. This is a picture of it taken in 1970, which was shortly before it was burned down in December of 1970. So the house itself is gone. So don't be looking for it because you're not going to find the house. Uh, you know, I've heard from my parents and other people that are older than me when they they go. That was like the the teenage hangout sometimes, for better or for worse. It was the hangout, one of the hangouts. But it was it was torn down or burned down. Uh, the state, not state, the Swanee River Water Management District owns the property now. And they have preserved what's left of it, which basically is part of the foundation. The, the water cistern, uh, the underground portion of the barn, it's called the back barn, but uh, depending on where you're standing in it, it's, it's a long barn, and some of it goes about this high into the ground. It's bricked. The, the above structure is gone. It's been a few years since I've been there. Noble A. Hall briefly served as Lieutenant Governor under Governor Drew. Noble Hall was from Suwannee County. Not sure if he was originally from here. No, he was not, as I look at my notes. He was born in Georgia. Raised on a plantation. He attended the uh, Chatham, Academy, Academy, Chatham Academy in Savannah. Mercantile pursuits. He moved to Florida in 1851. Here is what became Swanee County. It was not Swanee County yet, but he moved here, got into business, did, did lots of different things. When Swanee became a county, he became our first sheriff. So Noble Hall was our first sheriff. Um, and he lived, and part of his family lived in a house that still exists on County Road 49. It's called the Hall Hawkins House because the Hawkins family owned it after the Hall family. Um, Ironwood Preserve, I believe is what it's called today. Mm -hmm. But on 49, all that property, but there's a house. I don't think I've got a picture of it. 
Nope. But anyway, that's an old house built in the 1850s. So I believe he's the one that built it, either that or close family. But he lived here for many years. He became lots of other things in the Civil War in the House of Representatives. He was president of the convention where Florida seceded from the Union. He served as a captain in the First Florida Cavalry during the war. After the war, he moved from here and went over to Jacksonville, went back into business. He moved to Sanford for about three years. Basically, he was in Jacksonville for the rest of his life. He was sworn in as our lieutenant governor on January 2nd, 1877. The next year, he was elected to the U.S. House, to the US House of Representatives. But it was a contested election. There were some issues, and uh, the election was contested by Horatio Bisbee, who was then put in to replace them. So, election issues again. Not the first time that's ever happened around here. And uh, he is removed from office, and Bisbee is put in his place. So, you know, Noble Hole again, our first sheriff, big into politics. Meanwhile, business is going on in Swanee County at this time. We had steamboats prior to the Civil War. Well, there's a little hiatus for a couple years after the war because all the steamboats were either destroyed or, or sunk or captured, whatnot. So there's, there's nothing here for a couple years. The first known steamboat to return to the Swanee River after the Civil War was one called the Waywanock, built in May of 1863. It served in the Union military. After the war, it is... Uh, Transferred to the South by 1872, she is sailing up and down the Swanee River between Cedar Key and New Troy, which was the county seat of Bay County, delivering supplies, selling things, and whatnot. Uh, a couple years later, she has moved over to New Orleans and kind of goes from there until she's destroyed or broken up. The next one was the David Uly, 89-ton steamer, built in Cedar Key. She was 82 feet long, 22 feet wide, four feet deep, so not the biggest, not the smallest steamboat but one of those that ran on the river. She was very plainly built. She was named after Senator David Uly, David Levy Uly. Levy County is named after him. The town of the city of Uly is named after him. He had a railroad. He built the Florida, the original Florida railway between Ferdinand Beach and Cedar Key. We talked about it, I guess, in the Civil War discussion a little bit. Anyway, the David L. Uly was the next team on the river. Very plainly built, mainly a freight carrier, occasionally passengers, but mainly just freight. And she served for many years on the river. Um, but then by 1885, she was abandoned down at, close to the mouth of the Swanee River. And uh, supposedly her remains are still down there. Up to the 50s, you could see her. This is a picture from the 50s, supposedly of what was left of her with trees growing up in the middle. Uh, but there are the remains of that steamboat, which most people assume to be the David Uly, still there today. In 1870, We've already had a discussion by African Americans of, of having a place of higher learning, the Florida Institute. Meanwhile, in 1870, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, AME Church, decides they want to have a place of higher learning and edu education for their folks. And so they choose Live Oak as that location. But they really don't do anything about it for a couple of years until they get wind of the Baptist, the Florida Baptist groups uh, with Florida Institute. They, realize, okay, we've got some competition, so we need to kind of put this into action. And so they established this school called Brown's Theological Seminary or Brown's Theological and Classical Institute. So in 1872, they buy up 10 acres from Nancy Partially, who basically, she and her husband set up downtown Live Oak as we know it today. But they buy up 10 acres in what is now John Hill Park, Recreation Park, and they start building their school campus there. July 4th, 1872, there is a great fanfare held as they lay the cornerstone. Over a thousand people attend. It's a big deal. So things are going good. 1873, they call it, they rename it to Brown's University of the State of Florida. So it's still incomplete. The building is not finished. They don't have any students yet, but they renamed the school already. But the school never opens in Live Oak because there are some things happening, things like scandals, fires, uh, the 1873 financial panic throughout the country, things like that, uh, embezzlement, then a hurricane. All that within like a, a year's time kind of tells them maybe we shouldn't build here or finish this. So they don't. 
I think actually the guy in charge, a preacher that was in charge of the building, we've got one of the court cases that the, the courthouse still, and it was, he basically was taking the money and not paying the workers. So the workers sued, and eventually, like the carpenters and stuff, they sued for all their wages, and they won, and basically the, the building was torn down, sold to the highest bidder and dismantled. So, Brown Theological Seminary does not open up in Lyman, although it is uh, being built here. They decided in 1983 to move it, reopen it. They reopened it in Jacksonville, a place called Edward Waters College. And it still op operates today as the oldest private college in the state of Florida. So, Edward Waters College started here. Just never had any students. Let's see. That's how, that's how big Live Oak was. That's how central it was to Florida, that we had two African-American schools here in the 1870s, briefly. And then... <laughs> on for Ford Institute for, for 40 years, 50 years. Uh, I'll hit that in just a second. Meanwhile, we got other things going on in Suwannee County. We've got more newspapers coming out. The uh, Live Oak Advertiser, which was bought out by a guy named Daniel M. McAlpin, for whom McAlpin's named. He later becomes editor of what becomes the Suwannee Democrat um, because he renames his Live Oak Advertiser to Florida Bulletin. Florida Bulletin merges with another uh, newspaper in 1890. Seven, I believe, if memory serves, and it becomes a Swanee Democrat, which up until a couple years ago was our major newspaper. There was also the Florida Crescent, which was established in 1876, quote, devoted to the interest of Live Oak in Swanee County. It doesn't last long. There's lots of newspapers that only last a short period of time, a couple years, those kinds of things. As that's going on, we have the conduct lease system that is set in place by Governor Drew. Florida's not the first, uh, first place to have it, nor is the last place to have it, but we have that lease system instituted. Basically, part of the reason behind it is under the previous administration, Republican carpetbaggers and whatnot, the state prison system had gone to shambles. Um, prisoners were dying left and right. They just were not taking care of them at all. Uh, the buildings where the prisons were being held, which Chattahoochee at the time, was in disrepair. And it was just costing the state an arm and a leg. So they decided, hey, let's put these guys to work. Let's lease them out to people. Let's make money. And hopefully these guys will be treated you know, decently. It didn't really happen that way. But in 1877, these two guys named C.K. Dutton, who used to be in New York City, and Major H.A. Wise, operated probably the uh, largest naval stores business in Florida at the time. So timber, you know, turpentine, timber, those kinds of things when they saw a lot of wooden ships being built. Uh, so they operated here mainly in Swanee County. It goes to surrounding counties too, but mainly in Swanee County. And this business is so large that in 1877, they leased half of all the state prisoners to be put into place to work on these, uh, these camps, these turpentine camps and whatnot for their naval stores business. Lots of people coming in. At the same time, we've got a 100% population growth over a 10-year period. So between 1870 and 1880, we go up to 7,161 people in Swanee County. So that's double what it was 10 years prior to pull up the uh, you know, Civil War and stuff, or right after Civil War, excuse me. That's despite three hurricanes that hit within about two weeks, three major hurricanes that hit within two weeks, wiped out a lot of stuff, including our cotton sugar cane and whatnot. The convict lease system, in theory, was a good thing. State gets paid. These companies provide food, clothing, shelter, health care, so as it was. In practice, not so good. This is a picture of one of the buildings. Uh, I don't even know what necessarily Swanee County, but this is kind of typical. Laying side by side in beds, their chain usually chained all the way through. You couldn't get up without asking permission, otherwise they'd shoot you. I mean, even just to sit up and roll over, if you could roll over, you had to ask permission. There's a book that was written in 1892 or 1893 by a guy named J.C. Powell. He was captain of the convict labor system in this area. Uh, he wrote 1892, it's called American Siberia. The library should have a copy. If not, you can download it online for free. It's 400 pages. It is a very interesting book because 
90% of the book takes place in Suwannee County because, again, we had half the state convict uh, labor, half the state's prisoners working convict labor camps in the 1870s, 1880s. The book starts out with them arriving in Live Oak, getting off the train in Live Oak. And Mr. Powell writes about it. It's very interesting. You can read all kinds of stuff. Some of it's fancy. It's hard to believe, but it's interesting. It's just, it's, it's funny in the story. Some of them are interesting. Some of them are sad. It's just, it's crazy. It was a different time. There was no fence. You had basically, here's the point. You can't go past it. I've got guards there. If you get past it, we chase you down and or shoot you. Close out this presentation a few minutes late. Reconstruction ends in 1877. Basically, many southern states, the people, the citizens within, have gotten tired of the corruption. They've, they've gotten tired of the embezzlement. They've gotten tired of, of being desecrated, being plundered by the Republican Party, by carpetbaggers, by scallywags, by those who were not looking out for their state's best interest, but their own interest. And so gradually, they, as voting rights are restored to folks, they start voting the way they want to. It's, you know, democracy. And uh, they vote. They vote. And so the real end of Reconstruction ends in 1876. There is a presidential election. Basically what happens is the two primary challengers, one Republican, one Democrat, neither one of them get a majority. Uh, you know, enough of the electoral votes to become president outright. And so Congress has to kind of decide, and they basically work out what's called the Compromise of 1876, because that's when it happened, or the Compromise of 1877, because that's when it went into effect. But basically what they did was agree that the Republican, who was Rutherford B. Hayes, would become president over the Democrat, who was Samuel Tilden. Samuel Tilden had more electoral votes, and more popular votes, uh, this guy, Tillman, should have become president. He had the most of each. But the Congress and those, the powers that be, these folks, these 12 folks here, decided, all right, let's compromise. We'll let Rutherford B. Hayes be president, but the Southern states said, we'll allow that if you get rid of Reconstruction, if you end Reconstruction. So basically, that's what happens. Uh, Reconstruction ends in the South, everywhere. Hayes becomes president instead of Tilden. And with the end of Reconstruction, Democrats are put back into office. And unfortunately, that means there's a lot of disenfranchisement of blacks, African Americans. Um, they lose a lot of the rights that they had gotten over for a few years. Now, there was lots of issues with that. but. Basically, these 12 folks are the ones that are instrumental in getting the compromise passed. And this is a southern explanation of it, a political farce of 1876. They didn't much care for it. Um, you know, it ended Reconstruction, had somebody else in as president who probably shouldn't have been president, but that's how it was. And Reconstruction ends, and we move on from there. So. Next month, we'll talk about post-Reconstruction, late 1870s, and then the 1880s.